Let's take the Word of God, please, and uh, go to the book of Acts in the New Testament, and we'll read one verse here to begin tonight as I will introduce to you uh, the topic that I will be dealing with. Acts chapter number 1, and we'll read one verse. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. Here we have, of course, the disciples were gathered together after the resurrection and before the ascension of Christ. And they're gathered together and the Lord's speaking to them. I would love to have had the opportunity to be with the risen Christ. What a wonderful thing that would be. And there's nothing more real, nothing more powerful, nothing more life-changing than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have everything that we have. And he speaks to them and he gives them a commission. And he gives them something that I believe was not just for the 11 apostles. But I believe that it was something that he wanted them to pass down to us. And that he wanted us to hear through the written word of God that this is what we are to do. I'm so burdened about it. This is what we are to do. Acts chapter number 1, the Bible says, in verse number 8, and it would be prudent perhaps for us to read verse 6 and 7 leading up to that. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In other words, as he answers the disciples in their request, will you now restore the physical kingdom to Israel. The Lord Jesus says that will happen, of course, in the millennial kingdom. It will happen in God's timing. But He says it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. And I pray that you allow that to sink into your heart. Because as I read that, I gained from that, I gleaned from that, something I never gained or gleaned before. But in all our efforts... In everything we do, it is truly not for us to know the times or the seasons that the Lord has put in His own power. And we rush things sometimes. We want the answer now. Immediately. But the Lord says, it will come in time. And He goes on to say in verse number 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He makes a promise to them. He says, you will receive power. Now we know that this is a, an actual, specific promise, speaking of the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come upon them in cloven tongues of fire, and would dwell upon them, and they would speak with new tongues, and ultimately, of course, the gospel was given through that. And thousands were saved, because the Holy Ghost came upon them. And I want you to know and understand something today. We must all understand it. That we will never have power in witnessing, if we witness at all. But we will never have power in witnessing unless the Holy Ghost is upon us. And I'm not speaking about having to have a Pentecost again, but the Holy Spirit having power in and over our lives and the words that we speak and the things that we say and do. Just as the disciples needed the advent of the Holy Spirit on that mighty and powerful 
day of Pentecost. So we need the Holy Spirit of God when we seek to witness to people for Christ. Because our efforts will be in vain. Our efforts will be in vain. I, I did not plan to do this, but I want to bring in very briefly something we spoke about last week. Because a question was asked about the sin in, in, in the Gospels that's often referred to as the unpardonable sin. And we spoke about that a little bit. But this is why it's so important that we had the Holy Spirit on us. Because we know that a person cannot receive Christ without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And how is the, the Holy Spirit going to work and convict that person if he's not first working through our own words that we say? And as we take the Word of God and share with people. And so the, the worst thing that could happen to a person is that the Holy Spirit would not work in their lives. The Holy Spirit must be working. But He must first be working in our own lives. The Holy Spirit, He says here, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost. Any power we ever have in our lives, which by the way is not our own power, but any power we ever have in our own lives is because the Holy Ghost has come upon us and is leading us and guiding us. And he says, Then you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. We have four regions here. Jerusalem, the immediate vicinity of that area in which they were standing at that time. Judea, meaning the whole region that Jerusalem was situated in, the whole region of Judea, the southern part of that kingdom of Israel. Samaria, which really refers to an area north of there, and also the Samaritans. Now, Samaria has different implications here, but the Samaritans being people that the Jews had no dealings with. The Samaritans being people that the Jews actually hated, and they perhaps hated the Jews too. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Why was that used? Because the Samaritans and Jews didn't deal with one another. And he says, we must go and speak to the people that we don't want to speak to. We must go and give the gospel message to the people who are not those that are of perhaps what we think sometimes as our class or our type of people or the people that we would be inclined to speak to. But he says, all Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Now this goes to the whole globe, and we are to be engaged in that in some way. Whether or not we are involved in that, of course we can be involved in people who are from, who are from other nations. We can also be involved in praying for and supporting those who go to other nations, and, and I'm a, a, a proponent of that. I believe we ought to do that. I believe we ought to, to support that. But I wanted to go to this reference to begin tonight because the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit upon us is absolutely necessary in order to even take the next step. You know, we get, as the saying goes, the cart before the horse so often. And we try to witness and then we say, Lord, I hope that you, you worked. Well, we should be praying before we do it. Lord, would you work through me? God can do it by His Holy Spirit. God can do it. Tonight, as the Lord has led me, I am taking somewhat of a, of a detour, from, but we're still in our study. I'm not leaving that. But a little bit of a detour. We, we talked about uh, several things about what we believe about God and about Jesus Christ, about salvation, about sin, about man, all these things. They're very important. I hope you've gotten those. We still have all those sheets if you don't have them. I hope you have them all. But that leads us to this question. How do we lead a person to Christ? How do you lead a person to Christ? I have, I have dealt with this and spoken on this before, but I think until we get specific, until we get very specific, we won't ever do this. A man that I admire and respect greatly always said just over and over again, nothing is dynamic until it's specific. Nothing's dynamic until it's specific. Nothing is really real until it's personal. 
So I could stand here and talk to you about leading a person to Christ and tell you about how we ought to be doing it, but until you get some kind of specifics about it, we will have nothing to go on, nothing to use. And the Lord, I believe, has laid on my heart some things I want to share with me. Would you pray with me? And we'll begin. Father, I pray for your blessing upon this message and this, this lesson tonight. Use it, Lord, in these minutes that we have. May we make the most of it. May we, all of us, myself, all of us, every person, learn something that could be a help. We thank you for loving us and saving our souls. Help us to meditate upon these things without distraction. And give our hearts fully, wholly consecrated to you. Forgive us where we failed you. Use us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we lead a person to Christ? And I wish that every person was here for this, of course. But I will be taking my time in this. So rather than trying to cram it all and having a long night or anything, we're going to split it up. I'm going to take my time over as many weeks as the Lord leads and allows and until He returns, if He doesn't return before then. And uh, we will deal with these things. I am not an expert, of course, and I want you to understand something, that any time I speak on these things, it's not because I've figured it all out, or that, I, or that I have it right, have it all right. But God has shown me some things that I believe that if you'll lend your, your listening to that, not to what I have to say only, but ultimately... Only what the Lord has to say, I hope. But if we'll lend our ears to that, I truly believe that they can be a help to you. You know, winning a soul to Christ is not something that we can affect ourselves. What I mean by that is we cannot save anyone. I know you know that. But we cannot save anyone. And we cannot really say... No one can say, I'm skillful at soul winning. I, I wouldn't say that, and no one should say that. Could not say I'm skillful at soul winning, or I'm good at soul winning, because who's really winning the souls? Who's really saving the souls? It's not about skill, and it's not about numbers. It's not about, oh, look, I led 500 people to Christ in my lifetime. That's wonderful if you did. Number one, everybody doesn't have to hear about it. If it's really for the Lord, why does anyone need to know? And secondly, sometimes we try to force things. And that's a very unfortunate thing that without trying to use my own words just to degrade others, I know that many have unfortunately done that, have just tried to do a simple, quick thing and ABC, do this, and you're good to go. But a person's heart has to believe in the Lord and come to salvation, sometimes we have to give it time, a little bit of time. Be sensitive to the Lord, and we say the things we can. I try to urge people. I try to, I try to be very, <laughs> very passionate about it. I try to give them an opportunity right there. Try to bring them to the place. Are they either going to receive Christ or reject Christ? But we, we can't force things, especially for our own benefit. We should never force things because you say, I want to say I won the soul to Christ. We can't force it. Because you know what the Bible says? That one planteth, another watereth, but God giveth the increase. We are simply those who are planting and watering. We may be reaping, and that's a glorious thing. We may be reaping, but God gives the increase. And I pray the Lord will teach us that truth, that God gives the increase. Therefore, God gets the glory. We don't get the glory. I can't say, oh, we led this amount of people to Christ. Well, who's getting the glory there? Who's getting the glory? God's the one who saves. And don't be discouraged if there's not immediate results. Don't be discouraged. You know, I've had opportunities and times where I witnessed to someone in a short amount of time and... Maybe they bow their head and prayed and received Christ in that short amount of time. There's other people who 
who I've witnessed to many times, and they never did. They never did. We can't be discouraged if there's not immediate results. We can't be discouraged if we think a person comes to Christ and then we say, well, their life's not living like it. The Lord knows. We just keep on that person, keep helping them grow, keep trying to help them the best we can, and eventually we do the best we can. We focus our efforts somewhere else if needed. But let us not be discouraged. God is responsible for the results. And so we know that we can't get glory. We can't say, I I figured this out, I'm good at it, or anything like that. But the Bible does say, as we've mentioned before, in Proverbs 11, verse 30, he that winneth souls is wise. In other words, I believe that means a person who seeks to win souls. A person who seeks to share the truth of salvation with a lost person is a wise person because they realize this is the most important thing I could do. As Mr. Spurgeon says, it's the most royal employment of any Christian. He says the winning of souls is the most royal employment of any Christian. He also says, this is Spurgeon, I'm not saying it's not even in the Bible, but this is what Spurgeon said, that it should be the main pursuit. Now, I didn't say this, but he says, it should be the main pursuit of every true believer. I'll leave that there. But I want to give you today some things that I hope you'll consider. Why are we on this earth? That's, that's the question we ask ourselves. Why are we on this earth? Is there not a cause? Remember David said that? Uh, when Goliath came to be fought, and he said, Will anyone fight with me? And David says, Who is this man that defies the armies of the living God? He says, Are we just going to sit here and watch it? Or are we going to do something about it? Is there not a cause? That's what David said. Is there not a cause? And I ask you that question, is there not a cause? Is there not something that we are to do for Christ? Are the lost not per- <laughs> excuse me? Are the lost not perishing around us? The song that gripped my heart um, that I learned recently says, "Dost thou not care that millions are dying?" dying in sin and despair, waiting for someone to tell them of Jesus. Yes, waiting everywhere. Waiting, waiting, waiting for someone to help them. Waiting for someone to bring them the light. Waiting for someone to tell them of Jesus, who cleanses from sin's dark night. We must bring them the light of Jesus. I'm so burdened about it, and I am not where I ought to be. None of us are, of course but may God stir our hearts. Would you write some things down? I encourage you to do that, just some basic things. And I'm not going to give you a lesson sheet or anything tonight, but I'm going to encourage you to to write it down, uh, to personally take a pen, a pencil in hand, and put the things on paper. It can be more effective, more meaningful, and impact us even more uh, as we do that. But these are basic things. but some things I think the Lord specifically uh, put in my heart. Number one, how do we lead a person to Christ? Number one, one word, pray. Here's the verse, if you'll turn with me. You don't even need to turn there, but let's lay our eyes upon it. Turn with me, if you will, please, to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, here's the verse that we, I suppose we could say it easily. Probably a child could very easily. But I fear lest many times the most familiar verses in the Bible become the least meaningful. Because we don't ever look at them. And we don't open our Bible and look at it because we think we know it. But what does it actually mean? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, this little verse in verse number 17, what does it say? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. To cease means to stop. To cease means to quit. And he says, pray without ceasing. Now, 
I, I, don't, I don't think this means we pray 24 hours a day. We've got to sleep too, don't we? But he is saying don't ever give up on prayer. Don't ever give up on prayer. And in every situation, pray. Pray about it. Pray before it. Pray during it. You know, it's, it's a good thing to have a habit of praying just any time during the day, throughout the day, praying, speaking to the Lord. You know, the wonderful thing about it uh, is that we can do that. I heard the song a little bit ago, I come to the garden alone, and that he walks with me and he talks with me and tells me I'm his own. And we can walk with the Lord, we can talk with the Lord. That is a relationship we can have with him. But pray without ceasing. Don't ever let up on it. Don't ever dial it back. But dial it forward. Let's pray more and more. Soul winning, as we're dealing with specifically here, must be preceded by prayer. I, I believe, of course, God could give opportunities in the moment. We take those opportunities. But when there's a planned time of soul winning, then we should never do it without prayer. We should ask the Lord for opportunities. You say, well, I can't really go to soul winning. Well, if that's the case, you can still be a soul winner in your life. You can still pray and ask the Lord for opportunities that He would give you and pray that you would see people. I pray that I would see people from God's eyes. That I would not just see them as a cashier or as just a co-worker. Or I would not just see them as someone that's walking on the sidewalk. But I would see them as a soul that needs Christ. And when we do see people that way, it changes our whole perspective. And sometimes it burns our heart very greatly. Because we know we can't help every person. But God can put people in our hearts specifically that we should speak to. We pray for opportunities. Pray before it ever happens. Then pray for wisdom when the opportunity comes. Pray that God will give you the words to say. The wisdom of what is it that I should speak about? What is it that I should emphasize? What should I say in this situation? Pray as you witness. You say, I'm talking while I'm witnessing. Yes, sometimes they're talking. You can pray while they're talking. You can pray, you know, if you can multitask, you can pray while you're talking. Between the words, Lord help me. Give me the words to say. Something we can do. Pray as you witness. Because if we don't have the Lord, we'll be confused. If we don't have the Lord's guiding and the Lord's help, we'll be jumbled up, we'll be confused. But the Lord can give clarity. I want to say this, I believe it's very important, that no measure of knowledge is greater. No measure of knowledge is greater than the leading of the Lord as you witness. You could um, be an encyclopedia of knowledge. You could know the whole Bible. You could know all kinds of other stuff about religions. And you could rattle on a long time. I suppose some of us could do that. But you know what's greater? It's following the leading of the Lord. Because that person doesn't need to hear everything in that moment, but they need to hear something. They need to hear the message of the gospel. They need to hear about the cross of Christ. They need to hear that the Lord Jesus died for them and that He can save their soul. No measure of knowledge is greater than the leading of the Lord. Pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you specifically that way. Pray that the Holy Spirit would lead you. And, uh, you know, I think prayer is the number one thing. I think it's the most important thing. Because we can get confident in ourselves, but we never should be. But confident in the Lord. You know, sometimes I think about this matter of confidence. And I think, I can't have any confidence in myself because I'm weak of my own strength and abilities. But then I realize I can be confident. But not in myself, but in the Lord. Because although our sufficiency is not of ourselves, I can do all things through Christ. 
And that's not a prideful thing to say, I can do it all through Christ. Because He gives me the strength and the ability. So always pray, 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 pray. Number two, it's very important. Read and know Scripture. Read and know Scripture. Turn back with me, if you will, or excuse me, turn forward with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Oh, we know the verse. A lot of simple verses. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Verse 15. Oh, there's that little dirty word, right? Study. (laughs) We don't like to do that, do we? He says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God. The goal of our study is not to be recognized by man, but to be approved in God's sight. And then when we know Scripture, when we when we understand and know Scripture, we commit it to our minds and our hearts, then we won't be ashamed because we'll have a better understanding of how these things work together and rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, I've spoken to people who could extrapolate some verse out of some, some book somewhere in the Bible that they found, and they decided this is what it means. And they build everything they say on that. And you can really lead somebody pretty far into the weeds with that. You can lead somebody pretty far off with that. And so I would encourage you, let us not, if you don't have an understanding of something, don't speak on it. But speak on the things you do understand. Because there's things you do understand in Scripture. And that's what you can share with people. That's what you can speak to people about. And we won't be ashamed of that. We'll be using Scripture rightly, rightly dividing. That's a very interesting word that's used there, dividing Scripture. In other words, it talks about the pieces that go together in Scripture. The pieces of the Old and the New Testament and all the different time periods and all those involved. And uh, we try to deal with dispensations uh, not long ago. Well, I guess it was a year ago or so and uh, kind of what the meaning of all that is. But read and know Scripture. Read and know Scripture. I would encourage you with a few things, because this will be the best way to help you be prepared to witness to somebody. Because when you're talking to a person, uh, you, don't, you can't go find a book somewhere and say, let me read this and I'll come back to you. If you have that opportunity right there and then, you've got to have it in your mind. You've got to have something in your mind. Because otherwise you're going to draw up a blank. But knowing Scripture is the best way to help you be prepared. Not knowing other religions. I've said that so many times. But it's not knowing other religions. That's not the best way. That's one way. It's not the best way. The best way to be prepared to witness to someone is to know Scripture. Because then you can speak about Scripture, you can speak the Scripture, and then God can work through that. Because the Holy Spirit of God works through Scripture. He doesn't work through man's words. But when the Scripture is being spoken, there's power in that. And the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So if that's the case, then we want to get God's Word in the best we can. You know, there's a place for explaining things and using logic and asking questions and all that that I I want to get to, but the Scripture is paramount. Scripture is the most important thing. Trust the Scripture. Trust in Scripture to give you the answer more than other knowledge that you may have. I would try to be in the habit of uh, having Scripture that you use, that you're very familiar with, that you can speak to people about, when it comes to salvation. Start with, with Scripture. And as the Word of God says, you will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. 
If someone, uh, if someone asks you a question that you don't have the answer for, you can say, I don't know. Let me get back to you on that. But it is a shameful thing if we don't know any scripture. We can't even point someone where to go, where, where to look. I want to come back to that a little bit later about specifics with that. But knowing scripture, committing it to our hearts, committing it to our minds. Scripture is a wonderful thing. It's a purifying thing. It's an encouraging thing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know that many Christians don't get a lot of Scripture in them, but it can make a great difference in your life. I hope that you will read and know Scripture not just to witness, but that you will read and know Scripture because of Scripture and because we love the Scripture. So how do we witness? Number one, pray in every, every step of the way. Read and know Scripture. Number three, always speak the truth in love. Always speak the truth in love. Turn back with me, please, if you will, to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter, chapter 4. This is a good motto for our lives. Ephesians chapter 4, we find in here, the purpose of the church to um, the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, to bring us into our likeness to Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. But then as we come down to verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. What does this mean? It means that part of our duty as a Christian is to speak the truth. Because we have the truth, don't we? And if we have the truth, then we need to speak the truth. But... Truth must be garbed, must be clothed in love. That must be the garment that truth takes in our lives when we give it to people. I try to, when I speak to people, um, try to speak about the Lord, I try to do it with a smile. Because this is something that is worth smiling about, isn't it? And with love. And so, we're not there to argue. And, and uh, you know, this is something we all have to learn because I have fallen to this myself. But we're not there to argue. That's not the purpose. We can have conversation. We can bring in the viewpoint of the truth. We're not really there to argue. We should not be defensive. But we should defend our faith with confidence. Maybe you should write that down. We should not be defensive, but defend our faith with confidence. So you could do it with confidence. You could do it with a level of that, of that firmness of knowing that this is true. Not that I'm right, but this is right. This is true. So we're not really being defensive, but we are defending God's truth. Why do we defend God's truth? Because of two reasons. When we speak to a person about Christ, we know two things to be true. Number one, we know that we are telling the truth about God. So when I'm speaking to a person, I can be confident because I'm telling the truth about God. This isn't something that I made up or something that a man con concocted. This is not something I read in a book somewhere, but in God's Word. And God said it. So I can speak with confidence. Number one, because I know the things I'm telling is true about God. Number two, because this is the most important message that person will ever hear and it can change their life. And so when we speak to that person, we realize, I am speaking to you. We may not say these actual words, but we act this way. We speak this way. I'm speaking to you about something that's the most important thing that if you actually take and receive it, it can change your life. This is the most important message that you'll ever hear. But we speak that with confidence 
but we speak it with a loving spirit. That's why 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 uh, tells us with meekness and fear. And that has to do with our spirit in which we, we speak things. A smile can make a difference. A kind word can make a difference. You know, it's amazing how some people, someone will say, well, they just don't want to talk to anyone. I can't talk to them. They're the meanest people you ever found. But then somebody else goes to them and they like to talk to them. And why is that? Because our demeanor, someone's demeanor can be such that it invites conversation and it invites that kind of good rapport with one another. But if we come about in an argumentative way, then that closes the door many times to the love of God shining through to their lives. We speak in love and personably. When we speak to people, speak in such a way that demonstrates, that shows that you care about that person. That you care about that person. Here's the verse that goes along with it. Would you write down Jude verse 22? And if some have compassion, making a difference. Of course, the next verse says, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. We have different kinds of situations. When a person is wondering, a person is going to, to that dangerous place and we have to be a little more firm about it, get out of there! But when it comes to sharing the gospel with people, we begin with compassion. Because the Bible says, Compassion makes a difference. You say, how can I make a difference? I ask the question, how can I make a difference in people's lives? By having compassion on them. By having compassion on them. And that has everything to do with the way we see a person. If we're seeing them the way God sees them. You know when Jesus was with his disciples there? He said to them, I have compassion on the multitude because they are scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he was compassionate for two reasons. Number one, they didn't have food. The physical need wasn't being met. But he was compassionate because of their spiritual draw. And they needed the Lord. He had compassion. We ought to have compassion. I want to give you one more tonight, all right? Number one, most importantly, pray. Pray before, pray during, pray after, always pray. Pray before it ever happens. Number two, read and know Scripture. And let the Lord lead you as far as as He will bring certain Scriptures that you can read and study and, and know with your heart and mind. Number three, may the Lord help me, help us all with this, to always speak the truth in love. Number four, I want to give you this final thing tonight. That is to show respect. Show respect. Please turn with me to 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter, towards the end of the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2. This is not a verse we, uh, we, we go to often. I can't remember the last time I ever heard it read in church. 1, Timoth or, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter number 2. I think it would be good for us to go back here just a little bit. Verse 12. Having your conversation, 1 Peter 2.12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, I had this thought in my mind that I was going to, kind of be funny about that and say, see, we're supposed to go on visitation, but I decided not to. Glorify God in the day of visitation. Verse 13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Verse 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. He says, honor all men. No matter how hedonistic 
or atheistic or hateful or ungodly or wicked a person lives, we are still to honor them. He says, honor all men. Honor them in that, that respect we should have to other human beings who are created in the image of God. Respect goes a long way. He says, honor all men. And I'm going to speak about some specific things about going to doors, and many of you help us with that. You, you may be witnessing another way. I hope you will come help us with that, but maybe you're witnessing another way. But these principles still apply. When we go to a door, when we go to someone, one of our chief goals should be that of having a good testimony. We should realize this person, they may not get saved. But when I leave their house, I want you to think about this just for a moment. When I leave their house, let's say I just spoke to a lady, and I leave her house, and that lady closes the door and turns around, what will she say to her husband? What's the first thing that will come out of her mouth? What would be the first thing, or you're speaking to a friend or a co-worker, and you walk out, and then they turn to the next person, what would they say? Would they say they're a nut? Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because you could be called a nut and... That's not, sometimes we're called fanatics because we love the Lord, but would they say, they were the kind, she was kind, he was, he was kind, you know, I want to think about that. Or would they say, I want to have any part in that. They seem to, to want to push it down my throat. So, we always want to have a good testimony. This does not mean that we be soft and shy away from telling the truth, but when you say it in love, there's so much more that can be said. So we should have a good testimony. We, I try to think of it myself uh, as putting ourselves below them and entreating them. We are, we are imploring them to hear what this is that I have to say. Entreating them when we speak to them. We should not act like we are right and they are wrong. Lord, help me not to do that. We should not treat to a, per, a person as if I'm right, you're wrong. But we should speak to them as I found the truth and God said it. And I want to share with you the truth that the Lord says. We should respect them as another human being because that will go a long way. Do you know that people reciprocate respect? If we ever expect to be respected, we must show respect. You know what Proverbs tells us? He that hath friends must show himself friendly. I'm not adding to Scripture, I'm just applying it, that if you want people to respect you, then you must respect them. If we have a disagreement, we can speak gently and firmly. We can speak in a gentle way, but firmly with the truth. We can disagree but not be disagreeable. We can share the gospel, share the truth. We still tell the truth about heaven and hell. We still tell the truth about sin. We don't shy from it. We don't back off from it. But here's the way I want to say it that I hope will just stick in our minds. And maybe if we do this one thing, maybe, just maybe, we could lead more people to Christ. I would say it to you this way. Be passionate but compassionate. Be passionate about what you're saying. Don't shy away from it. Be passionate, but also be compassionate in speaking to that person. Ask God to give you compassion for others. Ask Him to give that love in your heart for them. And we ought to respect their, their time. You know, it's true that People's attention span is very short. So it's very important that we get the, importance, the, the important things said as quickly as we possibly can so we can get the truth in. We should also respect their property. If you're going to a person's house or you're soul winning or something, you should respect their property. You should not walk on their grass. You should be careful with their door and all that kind of stuff. And we should respect their property because those things go a long way.
A person could be walking, looking out the window. I try to sometimes, you know, I, I get in the habit of maybe saying things at the door, and I really shouldn't do that. We really shouldn't be talking to one another at the door. We should be silent, wait for them to open, and speak to them kindly and directly, carefully, pointedly about what we have to say to them. We should show a good testimony as a Christian because chances are there have been many in that person's life who had a bad testimony. You know, I've spoken to so many people that said, oh yeah, I'm not a Christian because this person said this. Or I'm out of church because I remember this happened. And there's professing Christians that say that. Oh, I don't go to church anymore. Or church is not for me because I don't like the way they did it. Or I remember as a kid, this happened. I remember this happened, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. Someone had a bad testimony, and I, I would not. And it makes me almost tremble in, inside to think if I've ever done something that would cause someone to say, I don't want to be a Christian because of what he did, because of what he said, or the way he did it, the way he acted. And so let us consider, let us ponder these things. I have more I want to give you. I will, I will later. But pray, read and know Scripture, always speak the truth in love, and show respect. I uh, hope and pray that God will give us a passion. I want to close with this. One day, I will stand before God. I have an inevitable meeting with God. You have an inevitable meeting with God. There's nothing we can do about it. It's going to happen. And when I stand before God, I will not be able to retract, redo, or erase anything I've said or done or didn't say or didn't do. When I stand before God, I imagine in my mind sometimes the people I didn't tell about Christ looking over at me and saying, where were you? And I'm not saying it's going to happen that way. But maybe it will. And I know I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to give an account. May God help me. May God help us to give the gospel. Let's pray together, maybe. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the gospel of Christ that's made all the difference in the world and in our lives. And Lord, we're going to meet you one day. Help us, Lord, to occupy till you come. Help us to take these truths from your word. Use them, apply them in our lives. And maybe we don't think we've accomplished much, but if we've led someone to Christ, help us to know that the rewards of that are eternal. Thank you for the dear ones here. Bless them, Lord. May these, these things, this message be shared and given to others. May many be helped by the truths of God's word. We love you so much and thank you for all you've done in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you.